Hello, welcome to our MopsCon session, Personalities, Politics, and Operations, The Perfect Storm. We came up with the title of the session because if you work in moms, you know that every day is different and you never know what to expect. It's just like trying to predict the weather. Uh, you wake up on a Monday morning thinking you're going to work on one thing and of course everything can change. So how to deal with all those changes and the personalities uh, that you have to deal with at work. I am Courtney Makara. I am one of your storm chasers today. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm originally from Seattle. I lived in San Mateo for a few years and now Portland. You can see here a couple of places that I've worked over my career, about 12 or 13 years in marketing operations. And a little fun tidbit about me. I have three moms, three dads, one horse and one husband. My co-presenter today is Molly. Hi, Molly. You want to introduce hey, yourself? Hey, absolutely. So I am your other storm chaser, and I had the privilege of meeting Courtney, oh man, almost a decade ago at our time at Marketo. And I'm corn fed here, located in the nice suburb of Chicago, also known as Des Moines, Iowa. And fun fact about me is I've got three kids, three dogs, only one minivan <laughs> so far, and one husband, and excited to be here today and share share what we've learned over the course of our operations careers. Thanks, Molly. So our agenda today is to go through a couple different topics that are really the soft skills of marketing operations. Uh, it's not always about knowing HTML and CSS and how to build things in your different marketing automation platforms, but how to deal with difficult personalities, the d tough operations that you're going to run into on a daily basis. And a huge piece will be navigating politics, politics about budget, resources, expectations, all of those things that really can make your work life either a blessing or a curse. And of course, we'll wrap up with some resources that we want to share with you all, things that have helped us in the past and hopefully will help you in your current situation. And then of course, we'll end with a little bit of Q&A. All right, Molly, do you want to take it from here? I'll take it over. A wise person once said difficult people are the greatest teachers. Um, whether we appreciated those lessons or not, there's, you know, this is something you're going to run into, whether you're in operations or any other type of business. But really, you know, as we think about the personality traits and the characteristics of some of these difficult personalities, it's just how do you best overcome and how do you best learn? learn to work with them. So we're going to have a little fun with pop culture during the presentation today. And, you know, our devil, um, what is it? The devil wears Prada, Miranda Priestly, you know, she's our bulldozer, right? We've probably all encountered these, whether we've reported to bulldozers or we've seen them in more of like the C-suite. This typically is that intimidation factor, right? They're somebody who's coming in hot, using aggressive Aggressive words really um, is the force to be reckoned with, right? They like to control the room, um, generally in, in leadership roles more often than not, and typically have the my way or the highway demeanor to them. Um, you know, from my experience, and as Courtney and I were, you know, talking through talking through our, our personal experiences with some of these people um, during our careers, they're typically not the most like tech savvy and operational focused Um counterparts as well, which tends to make it really interesting as you're trying to navigate more of those types of projects that are under the marketing ops purview. And so when you're working with, you know, the Miranda Priestleys of the world, like it's really important that you're asking, asking questions, using data, um, you know, starting to document what you're discussing and what you're talking through. There's a couple of like key pieces here is like a lot of times keeping that paper trail is really good. Not only if they if they cross the line, um, you know, in terms of just the relationship, but also to keep keep that clear line of communication open and hold the accountability of decisions that were made and how you were how you came to the outcome that you came to. Um, and we'll talk through, you know, kind of the do's and don'ts in a later section up here for the personalities. But just going through, um, you know, the bulldozers, they're always going to be there. Generally, going to sit it the leadership level. And it's really important that you are cognizant of how, how you're overcoming these in the most professional way that don't get you on that kind of blacklist. And then when we think about, you know, the next personality that we run into, we've got our wonderful Bella Thorne, you know, are we team Jacob? Are we team Edwards, the wonderful indecisive, right? These are, these are the people who, um, are probably the hardest personalities in my from my experience to work with because they're the ones who don't want to make a decision, right? Um, they enjoy enjoy you know group think and bringing everyone together. Um, you know, I 
you watch a lot of Big Brother, right? They're the ones that don't want to get the blood on their hand from reality TV and, you know, want to be everyone's friend and don't want to make the hard decisions, even if they're in the position to to make those. You know, I had a boss once who was just like the epitome of an indecisive person, right? Everything was a conversation and it was the same conversation over and over again, even though we've already made the decision of what we were going to do. Um, and so, you know, when you're when you're working with when you're working with the person who doesn't want to decide, right? How do you overcome those situations? One of the biggest pieces is set the deadline for the decision. I mean, it has to be very clear that like, this is the date the decision needs to be made. And your expectation as the leader of this project or ultimately the accountable person for dr driving this decision is, is to get the decision made by this day. The other piece that's important is like help guide them through the decision-making. It might, it might be that they're not, um, they're not confident in how to make the best decision, right? So if you can help coach and manage up and help guide them through the decision-making process, they'll feel more confident in the decision that they're going to be making. Ask them to send questions before the meeting and try to stick to an agenda so that it doesn't get deflected and doesn't go down a rabbit hole of like, let's open this up and start from scratch again after we've already done this three other times as well as, again, the paper trail, right? So sending the summary of like what was decided on, this was the date it was decided, these are the meeting notes, holds the accountability back to what was agreed upon. And I'll flip it over to Courtney for our next personalities. Thank you. Yes, I have been uh, charged with explaining the, the Woody personality, the know-it-all. Um, and this is someone who oftentimes monopolizes conversations, but they're not quite the same as the bulldozer. They can be dismissive and poor listeners. They can make decisions. They might not be the bulldozer that talks over you. They might sit quietly in the corner and be very judgmental, um, but they definitely feel like they've been there, done that. And the bullet point on here is that they are generally technically skilled. They actually might know a lot of things and maybe they've been in your role before they've been promoted. They've done that job. Uh, maybe they do know HTML and CSS or they're in the engineering organization and they think, oh, you're just doing marketing ops. I could do that. That's really easy. Um, and so how to overcome this? I think really it's important to um, compliment them on their knowledge and really try to find a silver lining to be their friend and obviously try to be as genuine as possible. But if they are super confident and they do have a lot of knowledge, you really want to try and soak up some of that from them and really become partners. A lot of times I found that this is like the Salesforce admin, business operations, again, engineering teams um, that really are working in a much more technical skill than yet again, even marketing operations. They might log into uh, a marketing automation system or platform and say, it looks so easy. It's all cartoony. It has this WYSIWYG editor and they're writing in full code. So asking a lot of questions and trying to view them almost as a mentor, um, I think will really kind of bring them onto your side and help you deal with some of the internal politics. And last but not least, uh, my most recent favorite TV show, Ted Lasso, we've got The Optimist. This is someone who really is known as like a yes man. They say yes to everything. They overcommit. They really are good at the quote unquote managing up and making the C-level executives really happy because they feel like they can turn around anything in an instant. And that can be really stressful for people in our roles. You know, we're the tactical workers, we're the doers that have to be a little bit more realistic about what are the resources, what is the technical skill that our team has, or even the technical uh, resources and platforms. So I think it is important to also kind of befriend these people because, you know, they're generally going to be someone in a leadership role and they are going to be saying yes to everything, but, you know, asking for details, having a contingency plan, and again, having that paper trail. They can end up being really good for your career. Um, I actually did work with an optimist. And at first I was, you know, found myself kind of rolling my eyes and a little bit frustrated because I was like, we can't do that in eight weeks or 12 weeks. But once we got a joint language and I was like, these are the, the hard no's, like this is my bottom line where I'm going to put my foot down. And then these other things I can be flexible on. They really did become like my biggest cheerleader and champion in the work environment. And so it ended up kind of uh, being a, a good thing for both of us in the long run. All right. So we've got our four personalities, Molly, you want to give us yeah. a little overview? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the important thing, 
that we all know is like every workplace is going to have challenging personalities, but it's really important that you just take the right approach on how to deal with them. Right. So the bulldozers, I mean, the big takeaways here is like probably not best to use stories, right? Those are probably not going to resonate with them really facts and being very clear on, you know, statistics, data are going to drive as well as not pushing for details because that's going to come off as challenging. So being really mindful on on how you phrase your questions to get get the right outputs and overcome those. When we move to, you know, our indecisives, don't ask questions. Um, those are like probably not going to get you anywhere because that's just going to open up the rabbit hole for for less decision making and less um, pieces there. Or if you are asking questions, make sure that they are closed ended versus open ended and, you know, really drive drive again towards putting it in writing, getting the documentation and holding them accountable for there. Um, You know, with the know-it-alls back to, back to Courtney's point, you know, taking more of that supportive collaborative approach with them and really complementing their knowledge and their experience versus pushing, pushing for details, asking questions is going to come off as, you know, really positive. And if you do it in a way that's not challenging and it's, you know, trying to learn and seeking to understand, from them, they're going to be great resources and great mentors there. And then, you know, the optimist, um, back to Courtney's point, these, these are the ones that I think are your biggest cheerleaders, your biggest champions. Once you can educate them on, on why, why we need to, you know, say no, or why something's not, not realistic here. Um, and sometimes it's just really bringing them, bringing them back to reality, maybe a little bit, um, there, but a few, you know, key tips at the end, you know, always provide benefit of the doubt. You know, when you're, when you're working with a personality, like I don't think it's ever people's and maybe it is, but generally not ever their intention to be a difficult personality. Um, And on hindsight, I might be a difficult personality too. So um, it's just really important that you try to give people the benefit of the doubt um, and understand where they're coming from, you know, seek to understand, understand where they're coming from, um, why they might be challenging, right? There's always two sides to every story. We all learn this, you know, in elementary school and growing up and probably through some hard life lessons, but really trying to level set that back. And then the other one is clear as kind. And this is something like I wish I would have learned earlier in my career, especially when I was starting out, like just being clear on like prioritizing the success and like honest alignment of a relationship versus like skirting a tough conversation is just so huge. So, you know, constantly like clear is kind, unclear is unkind. Like, how do you make sure that you're really, really prioritizing the relationship and the success of the relationship versus, you know, running away from the problem. And again, this is bigger than just mops, but so important um, on that day to day level as we're trying to hit, you know, generally tough deadlines and collaborating cross functionally in organizations. Perfect. And so, you know, as we move, as we move off of personalities and into operations, um, you know, there's never, never a lack of challenging situations that Courtney and I have, you know, come, come, come across over the years. And so you can just laughing because there's, you know, over the last 10 years, there's situations I've handled several times, especially the one I'm going to go into next. And each time I have a different learning lesson that I take away from this. So, you know, how do you professionally say that's not actually possible? So like the best situation, and again, it's like every company, leadership needs reporting. We need some sort of marketing analytics and contribution to pipeline. And you're like, great, okay. You know, this sounds like this should just be an intuitive ask. It should be easy. We should be able to knock it out. You know, C-suite's like, we got to get this for the board next week. And as, as we start diving in, we're not using campaign member statuses. We don't have contact roles, no attribution models really set up past, you know, first touch lead source. Leadership's making decisions off of data that they don't actually have. And like they need it next week. And, you know, I, I laugh because like old Molly, you know, Molly five, six years ago would have been like, okay, great. Let me just work a hundred hours and get this, get this out the door for you. Right. But new Molly, if you want to flip to the next slide is going to take a better approach to this, right. We're going to really sit down and sit down and understand, right. The first step is like, let's decipher what they're actually trying to get at, especially when you get a vague request. Like we need to know what's marketing's contribution to pipeline. Well, let's define that, right. How do we actually understand what the problem is that you're trying to solve? What are the business definitions of that? And how does that then align into, you know, our technical infrastructure that we have in place? Um, Next piece here is like, how do we educate our stakeholders on where we're at today, right? And, you know, generally, depending the size of the organization, they might not care, but 
you need to educate them on why why it's not possible and make sure you're educating um, your boss who's managing up on these requests as to like where the maturity level is. Um, and the fact that we're not tracking these things today is going to lead to inaccurate data. We can put the infrastructure in place, but it's not there now. So that's when we're mapping, what can we do today versus what can be built in the future? And how do we hit those deadlines in a way that we're providing the business with accurate information and the impactful information to make decisions versus scrambling to put something together that's potentially not going to be correct and might lead to, you know, hurting the business outcome. Um, and then the last piece is, you know, as we've come together and we've decided, you know, okay, we're going to build for, build for this. This is what this roadmap looks like for the future. Being really mindful on building for an 80% of, of um, the platform versus trying to build for a hundred percent where you're not going to be able to scale. Um, as you know, with all good things, plans change, scope creeps, businesses evolve and making sure when you are thinking about your um, infrastructure, whether that's in, you know, a marketing automation platform or in a CRM or another tool, you're really making sure you're not over engineering it to the point that if requirements change down the line, you're having to start from scratch again. So really important, you know, when, when you're getting a request and you're like, this isn't, this isn't possible, you know, maybe it's, maybe it is possible, but it's, not worth the effort and the outcome. How do you really set and educate, decipher, map, build the right way with your stakeholders? Awesome. Okay. We have another scenario. Uh, you're in your work situation of how do you professionally say to your boss or your team that I ain't got time for that? They come to you with a request, something that they want tomorrow. They don't have all the pieces, but they want you to start building anyway. Or on the other hand, you've got a huge project going on. You're launching nurture programs. There's GDPR. You already have the next six to eight to 12 weeks of your work life planned out. So how do you push back without pushing back? How do you say no without saying no? So this really is like an art and a science of figuring out how do you say it professionally? So you don't seem like you're always a blocker or a naysayer for the marketing team. So Molly and I put our heads together and came up with some recommendations. I think it's really important to get ahead of it. If you do have a plan for what you're doing this quarter, next quarter, maybe even next year, if you're really that organized, make sure the team knows. They might not have any idea that you're working on you know, an enrichment plan or data normalization, or maybe you're even changing your marketing automation platform. If you have a big migration coming up and nobody knows about it, they're not going to understand when you want to say no. And if there is a work back calendar for a launch, such as a webinar or an event or a trade show, do they know how much advance notice they need to give you? You're even something as simple as an email. If they're thinking it's just an email, I can send you the copy on a Monday and you can have it out by Wednesday. What does the work back calendar look like for your team? Do you have templates built out and make sure you're adding padding again for other revisions, edits? holidays. Um, people are always forgetting that there's, you know, three day weekends are happening all the time now. Um, and that you need to make sure that the team is realistically understands how much time it takes to get things done. Um, communicating your current obje objectives with the iceberg analogy. Hopefully you're already aware of this analogy that icebergs, we really only see, I think it's 10 to 20% of the iceberg is above the surface of the water. And there's a huge bulk of it underneath. I think it's a perfect analogy for the marketing operations team. Uh, we'll dig into a little bit more of that when we go into our resources at the end of the session today. Um, explaining that if I do say yes to your request, your emergency uh, event that you want me to put together, it means that all these other things that I did have on my roadmap for the next couple of weeks are going to fall and they're going to be pushed, whether it's that nurture campaign or again, something as important as a compliance program like GDPR, some of those dates can't be pushed and they really need to be paid attention to. So I think again, clear is kind, not just saying, no, I ain't got time for that. But like Molly said, say it clearly, explain why you would need to say no, um, which will really be kind in the long run. And last but not least, very important. I wish that every team had a, a formal MOPS uh, request submission process. Even if you are a team of one, if you've got one person in demand gen and one person in MOPS, um, it really needs to be something more formalized than a Slack message or even an email. There needs to be a list of all the different things that are a part of a campaign, as simple as an email send or a newsletter or a webinar invite. What's the title? What's the date? What's the 
CTA is there need to be a new page built somewhere else. I mean, you'd be really surprised when you sit down and think about all the things that go into the simplest of requests. It's often 16, 17, 18 steps. And if they don't have all those pieces gathered before they submit it to you, um, then obviously you're not going to hit your deadline. So formalize this. And it can be as simple as um, a Google sheet or um, a Google doc, um, a lot of times people use surveys or forms to get these so they can track when the date was submitted and fields can be required and things like that. As you get into a more mature organization and you have more budget, you can obviously use a project management tool, Monday, Asana, Jira, there's a bunch of different options out there and they might not be specifically made for marketing operations requests, but you can usually tweak it a little bit in order to make it work for you. And I think just having that formal process gives the visibility to the rest of the organization that you do have objectives and you do have um, things already on your calendar for the next couple of weeks. And last but not least, that post-mortem review. I am also guilty of not doing this. I think we all are, but um, I'm getting better and better as I get further along in my career. It is so important to go back and say, why did we make this deadline or why did we miss this deadline? And what can we do differently down the road? Is maybe our submission request process not thorough enough? Do we always have to go through and change the email template because we don't like the header or their logo or things like that. And I think scheduling those with the rest of your marketing team, whether it's the creative team, brand, product management, product marketing, or demand gen, again, helps them realize that they can't just run to you and throw something on your plate because marketing operations is often the only team that will see a campaign or initiative really from the very beginning inception all the way to the very end, because we're even helping these campaigns cross over the line into the sales organization. Are BDRs getting the information they need? Are the AEs getting the details that they need for any of these opportunities that we're creating? So I think once they see all the steps that you're involved in in a postmortem, then you'll get a little bit more respect around the business. Oh, goodness. Out of scope. This is a another really common one that happens in marketing and operations when someone comes to you and says, oh, can you edit the website? We found a typo on this page or a sales leader comes to you and needs forecasting or lead routing often comes to marketing operations. And you're like, wait a minute, that's not my job. My job is you know, managing the marketing automation platform, or you get a call from the finance team, or again, the legal team, the engineering team. And how do you not pull your hair out and scream and say, that's out of scope. We're not responsible for this. So some of these are going to seem, um, you know, kind of repetitive. And hopefully at this point, now that you've heard Molly and I talk a little bit, it starts to become a little bit of common sense of the professional way to say this is saying, you know, we have roles and responsibilities and make sure that they're public, make sure they're documented somewhere, um, understanding what is marketing operations responsible for, what is sales ops or revenue ops or business ops responsible for, and making sure that there are very clear swim lanes. And this might need to go all the way up to, you know, senior directors in your organization or VPs. So there's not this finger pointing of this isn't done because so-and-so owns it, or this isn't done because this team won't take responsibility for it, really understanding what you're responsible for. I think it's also important to, again, calculate how much you are either spending in the business or losing in the business because of these backlog projects. Um, if you keep getting these lists of things that are not getting done, again, using a, a spreadsheet or a Monday or a sauna tool to keep track of all the requests that come in that you just don't have the time or the bandwidth to get to, um, might start to get the leaders of your team or even the HR side of the business to realize, oh, maybe we do need additional headcount to support this team because of all the requests that keep coming their way. I think it's also really important, uh, and again, I wish I had done this earlier in my career, is to foster those cross-functional relationships. Um, a lot of times there are people around the business that think they don't have any idea what the marketing operations team is doing. It's that mystery black box in the marketing department of data goes in and data comes out, but it's in this mystery thing called Marketo that nobody has access to. 
but find the people that are asking questions and try to foster relationships in there. And you might find someone that really has a natural inkling towards how smart lists work and those and and or statements of figuring out how to pull a list together. I actually found some really talented marketing operations people that started out as SDRs and they weren't thriving in the SDR role, but as they started getting brought into some campaign initiatives, really decided that they liked marketing operations. So try to keep that in mind rather than, again, sitting, you know, whether you're sitting at home because you're working remote or sitting in your office and having blinders on and thinking, oh, I just have to sit here and suffer alone with no additional headcount. Try to take those blinders off and look around the organization that people that might be interested and be talented in the organization to help you out. I kind of alluded to this when I mentioned, you know, tracking these backlog projects and looking to your leadership or your HR organization and saying, we need more help. And if they're just not going to give you the headcount that you need, try to consider temporary or part-time help, interns, consultants. Um, you can sometimes take a big stressor off your plate for actually very little dollar amount. It might seem like a big ask, you know, $5,000, $10,000, but I I do bet, and I actually have experience going to leadership and saying, there's this big thing and it's going to cost us $8,000 to hire a consultant to do it. And surprisingly, with a snap of fingers, $8,000 really isn't a huge ask, obviously, depending on the size of your team and your budget and your company. But you'd be really surprised at that if it is something that can take a huge stressor off of your plate and you can outsource it, especially if it's a short-term project and they know it's a one-time expense, it's a lot easier to get that done than to ask for an actual headcount of a full-time employee. All right, all of our notes here for you um, that from all of the situations, when you're in a tough situation, I recommend uh, we'll send this out as a resource for the listeners today. I actually, after putting this together with Molly, have printed out this slide and it is on my desk. And when I am frustrated or feeling alone and feeling like there's just no possible way out, I will look down and remember, these are really good you know, verbs to remember, to decipher what people are really needing or to foster relationships. So hopefully this will be helpful for you when you come to your next stressful situation. And from here, we have a little bit more to help you navigate some of the politics in your working relationships. So when you <laughs> hear that you're being ye yelled at, just remember that people really care. And that's just the best way for them to communicate to you going from the, the Leslie Nope acronym here. So, you know, if you are dealing with some of those stresses at work, where again, you want to pull your hair out or you're sitting at your desk with your blinders on because um, there's a ton of different negative political situations that can come your way. Your team is being accused of blockers for success for another team. I think that's really common. Um, you might even be getting put on a pip. There are a lot of different things that can make you feel really checked out and burnt out when it comes to dealing with marketing operations work. So we have a couple uh, suggestions and resources here. One that I really love is the four pillars. Now I am absolutely uh, borrowing and crediting this to the Atumos agency. When uh, Edward came out with this, I believe it was about 10 years ago, maybe 2013, 2014. I mean, my mind exploded. It was all the things that I was dealing with and stressed out with at work. And he put it into both a verbal way to explain it and also a visual way. And I have used this dozens and dozens of times. So if you're not already familiar with it or you haven't shared this with your manager or your skip level manager, I highly recommend. Um, and in a nutshell, uh, it is showing that marketing operations is more than just one thing. The yellow box here of campaign operations is what most people think of when it comes to marketing operations. It's sending emails. It's sending out webinar invitations and hosting webinars, and oftentimes those nurture programs and engagement programs, drip campaigns, things like that. But there's so much else that goes on behind it. Platform performance is how does your marketing auto automation system integrate with your CRM or your Salesforce? How is that working? Is it integrating with other platforms as well? How easy is it for your team to use? Um, could uh, anyone from the marketing department come in and find what they're looking for? 
And then way over on the far right in the gray, we've got the development operations. These are often the much more technical skills, um, dealing with CSS, JavaScript, some coding, how your marketing automation system interacts with your website. And that can be a completely different set of skills that you might not have as a campaign operations person. So again, these are areas to start talking to your manager, your team, your VP about the skills that you currently have on your team, what future hires might look like, or things that you might be able to outsource. And of course, marketing intelligence starts talking about the attribution uh, issue that Molly talked about. Everybody wants attribution data. They're always trying to look for those answers of how much money is the marketing department spending versus how much they're bringing in. And that can not be uh, an easy thing to just pull out of your hat, especially if you're already struggling with the other three pillars of marketing operations. So definitely recommend uh, leveraging this if you haven't already. And the iceberg analogy, I alluded to this before, but you can see the, the top of the iceberg here in this graphic is very small and there's a huge chunk of the iceberg underneath the water. Again, what most people think about when, uh, marketing operations across the rest of the organization will be those webinars, uh, email blasts. Does the form on the website work? Oh, there's a contact us form. Where are those people going? And then as you kind of start to educate people a little bit more, they might understand that, oh, you're responsible for scoring and we know you're the team that controls the MQLs or you build nurture. But if we actually sat in a room with a bunch of marketing operations folks and we talked about what is it that you worked on in the last 90 days, I bet we would get more of a list like this. We are across so many different parts of the business. I'm not going to list off all of these, but I'm curious if you look across this slide, how many of these things has someone asked you about? And are you essentially responsible for and supposed to be the expert for your organization? And so when someone does come to you with that last minute request of, I want to do a webinar in three weeks, do they understand that, okay, if I say yes to this webinar, some of these other things might need to be pushed and are they even pushable? There are things like the database size constraints. If you have a deadline you're trying to hit, you don't want your marketing automation system to be shut down or be charged a penalty because you've gone over because you weren't able to work on that project because you prioritized something else. And we've got our levels of marketing automation maturity. So Molly touched on this a little bit earlier about making sure your team is educated about what your team can currently do. Not only what they can do technically, like what technological platforms do you own or what do you guys have on the education side? And if they're coming to you saying, we want multi-touch attribution numbers for the sales forecast for the finance team for next year, well, if you don't have a tool that is able to do that, or your team doesn't have the education to do that, that's not currently possible. So making sure the team understands, you know, as we grow and as we hire, you know, additional staff for the team, this is what we're going to be looking for, both in maturity of the tech that we decide to purchase and the employees that we choose to add to the team. And one of the best ways, you know, as you think about improving not only your maturity, but also your stakeholder maturity is like, how do you use that documentation and that process to really, really educate, right? Um, this education is key because they don't see what's under the iceberg, right? They're only seeing what what's at that top piece. And even at that top piece, they have no idea what what necessarily goes into that, right? Email, the email sends a great example, right? Um, there's, it's an email, it's easy, you just click a button and you hit send, right? But if you're missing just one step in that intake process, you don't have the graphics. It's not on your stakeholder to get you those graphics. It's it's then on you to go chase down your stakeholder to get you that graphic because they're now blocking you and slowing down your process and creating this administrative loop, especially if you have, you know, the creative department versus the copywriting department versus, you know, your demand gen who's doing the segmentation of the audience. You become, you become this bottleneck in that process if you're not getting those right intakes. And that's where really having those standard operating procedures is specifically for, you know, every, every task is ideal, but the repeat ones, right? Your email sends, your edits on the website, we're doing the webinars, we're running events and capturing the intakes and the inputs that you need. So you can go to, go to your stakeholder and say, here you go. Here's the process. Gather this, you know, you're in charge. You gather this information. This is your project. I will be here to support it, but I need all these inputs to actually get you that right deliverable and setting those service level agreements. This is how long it takes for me to turn around an email. 
And I laugh because, you know, people are like, yeah, I need a week to turn around an email. Why do you need a week? Well, because you're, you know, you're probably not going to get me everything up front and we're going to go back and forth on these things, right? Um, Realistically, if I have everything, it might take me 10 minutes, but generally I don't get everything. So really trying to level set and educate on why, why do things take time? Um, I can do this quick with errors or I can do this right and not have errors. And generally people prefer, prefer not having errors. Um, and really outlining, again, the roles and responsibilities of like as the campaign campaign manager, the person putting in the request versus the operations person, where, where are our roles and responsibilities here? Um, the other part is documenting your process, right? So this is especially when you're a team of one and you're, you know, growing and things are increasing, getting that documentation up front is going to be super helpful, right? You probably want to go on a vacation sometime. And you want to not be sending like emails while you're on the beach, which I have been very guilty of doing um, in my past. So spending spending time, document your process, make sure that you can have something that as your team grows, as you hire new people, as you can expand, you know, not only your career path, but also build that team up. It's easy to onboard, easy to educate, easy to bring bring people aboard. And then the other piece is like sharing what you're doing internally, right? Back to the iceberg analogy get on a lunch and learn with the marketing team or your key stakeholders. And it doesn't have to be like a, you know, here's why my job is hard or here's why you guys are a pain to work with from, you know, a stakeholder responsibility standpoint, which isn't what you're saying at all. Right. But it's, it's how do I help you get the better outcomes? How do, you know, we work together? How do I help educate on like what's on my roadmap? Right. And that, you know, especially when you're in more of like the campaign ops standpoint and you're really working to grow into more of the platform operations and mature not only yourself but also your organization like that's a really good showcase of like here's where I'm looking at from a roadmap standpoint here's how I'm reducing the amount of time that we're spending here's how I'm looking at the customer experience and not oversaturating communication with them by looking at you know our frequency of our emails and using some of that data to figure out you know what are the right messages that are resonating here's our test plan right you can really start to pull different levers and have impact in the organization not just be kind of the email the email sender, right? So use use that opportunity and that ability to really, really help level up, you know, the organization itself. Um, as we, you know, move to the next, next section, as Courtney and I were talking about, you know, what do we want to talk about today? Like, there's so many different topics. What, what was really important to us? One of the big pieces that we aligned on here is like, we wanted people to know that they weren't alone, right? Like, this is such, um, such a really cool, community and network that now exists that like, I don't, I don't know that it really was the support system that we have today, 10 years ago, right? It's, it's really evolved. And like, I think, you know, having this earlier in my career would have been a game changer. So I'm like, so grateful that it's here now. Um, and I hope that it keeps building up and, you know, like MopsCon, definitely not a thing. Um, so as we were talking about, you know, what are those resources that we use on a daily basis? You know, so when, when we need a laugh, right? Like, <laughs> memes. Memes are great. You've seen them throughout our presentation. Like these generally, I get on LinkedIn and I'm like, oh, thank you. This just hit hit me right square in the face of what I needed today. Some really great um, podcast out there. Um, <laughs> the How do you professionally say? Like, I get that it's, you know, not probably supposed to really be telling me how I should professionally say things and supposed to have some humor, but it's definitely been very helpful in managing some of those tough tough conversations and managing up um, and just, you can get to that break, especially when you've had, you've had that rough day or you haven't got as many wins, wins as you needed. Um, knowing that, you know, you're not alone and you've got this great community around you. Next piece is just, you know, when you need a friend, there's a lot of friends out there. Um, again, share these slides, drill into them, but just really good resources out there. I know, you know, anyone at these companies or these authors, follow them on LinkedIn. Like they're going to be great, great um, people to just follow in your network or reach out to based on based on their experience. I have yet to run into anyone in this community who hasn't been willing to share insights or provide advice or make connections. I mean, I think we're all we're all mops, you know, nerds and geeks at heart and like really passionate about this that we we jump at the opportunity to help somebody else out in this. Um, you know, the other piece is when you're ready to grow, right? Some great educational courses and resources and just just some really good, good books, like Crucial Conversations um, is probably one of the best, just best books that I've read ever. Um, 
and just how to handle those hard conversations, how to deal with not only conflict, but not just skirt around kind of the tough conversations and making sure you get, get to the end. And then, you know, surrounded by idiots. Well, it has a not nice title is a really, really good book on how to work with different personalities. Again, I might be the idiot, but um, you know, how do I, how do I become more aware of that? And how do I start, start working better with the people around me? So, you know, great resources that will get shared out in the slide deck. Again, back to Courtney's point, I have, I mean, printed the iceberg out of our own slide deck and have that at my desk as well as how do you work through the tough, tough principles. So like, these are resources that we, we actively are using and, you know, throughout the course of putting this presentation together, I think have helped our ourselves grow a little bit. So hopefully you've got questions and we hopefully also have answers. So really appreciate you guys having us today and we look forward to furthering this conversation. Thanks. Hello, hello. Hey. Hi, Molly. Hi, everybody. Uh, hey, MopsCon we, land. <laughs> hopefully you enjoyed the presentation and uh, we'll go through some of the questions that came through. Uh, appreciate the reference to the memes that I saw Amy commented that she follows Lo on Instagram. Um, I recently discovered Lo and I think she's hilarious. So if you have an Instagram account, highly recommend following her. Um, let's see, Molly, do you want to take that first question I saw came in was about postmortems. Do you want to jump on that one? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the way that I typically approach the postmortem is generally whenever you're wrapping up a larger, especially cross-functional project, like just making sure you get it scheduled in advance if you can. If not, like just really bring people together to just recap before you move on to the next thing. Um, you know, generally we launch kind of postmortems out of out of necessity when things go horribly wrong with the project, especially when you kick something off and there's a fire drill and then it's like, okay, now let's summarize, but make it a more of like a business practice that when we are launching cross-functional initiatives or even just larger scale initiatives to bring, bring everyone together just to recap and how do we better refine the process or what could we have done differently? And then if your team is running on, you know, a sprint cycle, like there's no harm in doing, you know, a, if you're running a two week sprint, like a 30 minute retro on that, just so you're continuously improving. Yeah, my thought with postmortems is you have to pre-schedule them. Like as soon as you have the request or there's a, something on the calendar or something for the team, pre-schedule it, otherwise it'll never happen. And do them more often than you realize. Even for something, you're like, oh, we do a newsletter every month. Have you ever done a postmortem on the things that are evergreen that you do every month and actually been like, oh, we should actually maybe do that a little bit, you know, smoother. So definitely recommend one, adding it to your system. Yeah. And, and one thing I would add is don't try to facilitate, like, especially like if you're doing like a product launch or a larger postmortem, don't try to facilitate it with somebody who has been a stakeholder or was involved in the process. Bring like an external person in from like HR or finance, like some other random team and just be like, hey, can you help us facilitate this meeting? Because then it gives um, the people who are really involved in the process, the steps, the opportunity to step out of the facilitation and really contribute. Um, so I found success in that. I've brought in usually HR or IT counterparts to help help facilitate just because they're really good at that dialogue and that conversation, but um, really That's good. That's a good idea. I like that one, Molly. I don't think I've ever used like a third party. I love that. If you own the process, you shouldn't own the facilitation of talking about the process. Yeah, people might not feel that they can speak as freely and like be critical of things. So I think that's great. What other questions do you guys have? Do you guys deal with these types of politics at work? I, I saw a couple comments about like the, the know-it-alls or the optimists. Um, would love to talk a little bit more about that. And really Molly and I were chatting <clears throat> before this today that why we did this topic, you know, we were like, we both, done technical things and we all work on operations and you know attribution is coming up and soaring scoring and sourcing and all that but the politics to me has been i think the most important part about uh establishing my career and growing and it's actually something that's coming up a lot with junior people or people that are new managers and they're realizing they have to manage up and manage down and it's some something that doesn't come natural to a lot of people. And if you have to really sit and think about how to make friends at work and, and not enemies when you feel like you're constantly fighting a battle. 
the tech can be easy, but the people can be hard, right? So how do you really make that cognizant effort to kind of mature yourself, but also help help others? Absolutely. Uh, let's see. Ask us questions. Ask us questions not about politics. <laughs> Let's see, Kimmy, actually, I think who, thank you for attending, Kimmy. We're so glad that you're here. Our keynote speaker actually came to our session. I can't believe it. But you had a note earlier about, you had your post-it note that says wait, one, two, three, four, five, which I really like. And then Amy said that wait could be an acronym. Why am I talking? So if you didn't see that in the chat comments, I love that. It's a really good way to think it's about It's probably that. just really good advice. <laughs> really good advice. Um, so Jeff, Jeff has a question. How do you feel about protecting others from politics? I think, especially from just being at a management level, my so I'll speak from kind of the management level. My philosophy is that you do need to let people have exposure to the different personalities in politics firsthand. But sometimes it's helpful to give them, especially if you're going into more of like that bulldo bulldozer personality, trying to set them up for success before the meeting, not just throwing them to the lines, especially if it's a junior person, but giving them the exposure so they know how to handle those situations and how how to be prepared and, you know, structure those conversations also helps give them credibility back when the situations are handled really well. Yeah, I think that's actually a really good question. I'm trying to think back as I bet I, I can think of certain managers that I had over my career, especially at when I was at SurveyMonkey that did a really good job of balancing bringing me into some politics and then taking me out of some and I was completely oblivious at the time but the politics that she brought me into were related to like the really close stakeholders either the creative team or the you know BDR sales team but she didn't really bring me into politics around other sides of the company like I wasn't involved in some of the engineering politics or things that were happening almost on like the peer level of um you know, getting bulldozed, but those are a little bit more like socially political rather than like departmentally political, I think is a good exposure to have because those are the things you need to work around and things are like socially political. I think you need to wait till you get a little bit more senior in your career. And I think part of, you know, as you manage down is giving some of the context on to why certain decisions were made. And some of those pieces are also just really helpful to make sure you're sharing even less about just the personalities in place, but more of like the decision making process and how how things operate, which generally can be driven driven by politics and personalities, but trying to help help educate kind of your team on how things get done and what what that looks like helps give them more of an understanding of the why they're working on certain things and that impact too. Yeah. Um, Kimmy asked, what personalities do we identify with most? Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. I mean, so I'd love to say Miranda I'm not Priestley. any of these, <laughs> but I Miranda probably Priestley, am. Bella Swan, Woody from Toy Story, or Ted Lasso. I, I mean, it's changed over the years. I definitely was the Ted Lasso early on. I think makes sense when you're early in your career and you just yeah. kind of want to be helpful. Um, but now, I guess I would probably say... Yeah, a mix between probably still on the Woody side of things. Um, so that's actually a really good question to go back and kind of yeah. reassess yourself. And I know that Kimmy was saying that, you know, she can talk a lot and she needs to kind of make sure she's reining herself in and that her bad personality traits aren't coming out. Molly, how do you identify? I know I was like, I'd say like I gravitate probably more, more towards the Woody. I also know that I, I wouldn't consider myself or call myself like an optimist per se. Um, I think I'm actually an optimistic pessimist just based on my need for continuous improvement. But um, when I think about that, like I always think that there's a way to solve a problem and that's where mm -hmm. I probably, pro oh, and, and things can always be better, right? So that's my pessimistic, optimistic viewpoint. So I'd say I probably gravitate to those. I think in some situations I have been forced to need to be a bulldozer based on the business need and just the role um, that I'm playing in a project or those pieces. Yeah. Um, I probably am not an indecisive. That's the one that I think I'm the least least yeah, equipped to. But I think again, Isabella for sure. <laughs> no, no, Team Jacob all the way. So, 
uh, remote work and politics. I do think it has made a big change. Um, I was very lucky in the fact that I went remote. I moved to Portland, Oregon and still worked for a San Francisco company in 2017. So I had about two years of dealing with that. And I would say they did a pretty good job, but there was definitely still, you know, meetings where I'd click into the Zoom and they'd forget to accept it. Or, you know, there's a lot of hallway conversations that happen. Um, But now with pandemic and COVID and everyone being remote, it's gotten so much easier. It's just a lot. People are a lot more cognizant of the hallway conversations and a lot more willing to just jump onto like a five minute zoom or even a phone call. I've had people say, can I just talk to you on the phone? So it's definitely getting better. Um, but I have new types of digital personalities. I bet there is, I bet there's like ghosters, people that just like hide behind their computer and, you know, never either share their screen or participate in some of the, again, the hallway conversations. And a lot of the business stuff happens when you're not, you know, in a super structured environment. Yeah, I was, I went remote um, in 2014. So, you know, this was, it kind of actually leveled, leveled the playing field a little bit um, for me. But one of the things that, you know, I think about is when we talk talk about like the digital personalities, so much of, um, so much of getting to know people is understanding body language and like being able to look at their mannerisms. And when we're spending, you know, the majority of our time getting to know our coworkers over Slack, I think that that's kind of put an interesting dynamic into, you know, reading between the lines and maybe not taking text so personally, you know, if somebody responded fine, you know, earlier in my career or something, I'd be like, oh man, they hate me. They're so mad at me. Right. But like, as you get to know, get to know people and their personalities, I think you read probably less into what they're saying. And the other thing that I think it's prompted more of is like asking questions, right. And seeking clarity and like not making those assumptions as well that you typically maybe would when you heard something in an office or before with somebody you don't know. But I do think there there's probably a lot of digital personalities that are going to keep coming to fruition, especially as we probably stay in more of a remote culture. Yeah. And I think there's some companies that really are trying to figure out what that remote culture is like. I mean, there's a lot of gamification on Slack and in Zooms. And do you sit in the first five minutes of a meeting? Do you talk about your weekend and your personal life? And some people just want to get right to the work if they're really busy. And I think figuring out that balance is really important and figuring out, you know, what do you want out of your work relationships? Mm -hmm. And is that socialization really important to you? And if somebody has the opposite you know, desires and that's okay. And if they want to get right to work, that's fine. Socialize with somebody else just because they, you know, don't want to share their weekend plans doesn't mean they're going to be a bad coworker um, or vice right. versa. If someone is very chatty and sharing all that stuff and you just don't have time for it, trying to figure it out how to make that balance at, at the end of the day. Um, backlash when reporting on underperforming campaigns and na- angry inner actives with just highlighting data and results. Ooh, that is an interesting one. That is an interesting one. I think my first, you know, reaction to that is, are you really, it's hard to just really highlight data and results. And like, is there any finger pointing or are people getting um, angry? Are they feeling defensive? You know, are you reporting it, you know, either upstream or downstream to execs or to peers? Um, That is an interesting one. Molly, what do you think? I think, you know, so I think about, you know, setting the expectations, right? So when you are going in and you are reporting on, like making sure that, again, back to the facilitation, you're facilitating a productive conversation, right? So obviously feelings are valid, people can be angry, especially if something doesn't perform right. But how do you flip that into something constructive in terms of, you know, what is the data telling us? Why, Why did it perform this way? And like, what's our plan for improvement? Like we can get really hung up on the reactive and like the retro perspective of what, what happened, but then how do we improve in wow. the future is I think where you, where you put more of that energy into making a plan and delivering on that. And again, back to like setting expectations, like finger pointing is not going to be positive um, in any way, way, shape or form in this. Um, you know, at I the end of the day, how much in. control you have too. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. I want to chime in and what does underperforming mean? Are you comparing it to historicals and like yeah. things are seasonal and the economy is changing and there are new competitors in your space? So like underperforming means you had an expectation. And if things didn't hit that expectation, who set that? Was it just someone threw a dart <laughs> at a board and was like, we need to hit this revenue goal? Yeah. Are you looking back at previous experience? So 
we are going to get cut off um, in two minutes. So we will keep talking okay. until they cut us off because there are yeah, questions. Yeah, there's two more questions. Um, most looking forward to in your MOPS career in the next few months and quarters. So I think um, I'll jump into that one really fast. So I, um, at Deal, have taken a new role overseeing really all of pipeline operations. So building out kind of a full fledged team around pipeline and MOPS is such a critical function in that. So building out kind of an additional full team is something that's just really, really exciting for me um, to kind of jump in and do. I'm getting really excited of product led growth, the PLG movement. It's kind of always been around and I feel like it's really coming to resurgent. There's more technology that is helping us measure it. I think getting for the longest time it was sales and marketing alignment. And now I think we are getting product and marketing alignment, which I think is really exciting. Um, and so that's what I'm looking forward to for 2023. Um, both b2b and b2c and the you know continuation of all of those across different platforms and helping that helping the sales motion with upselling kind of your freemium trial b2c users into enterprise level users and then in terms of uh last question just personalities translating across countries so i work for deal our whole business model is hiring internationally. So I actually have team members and coworkers on almost every continent and country. So um, definitely have had to make adjustments in terms of understanding cultural differences and norms and just how do we reciprocate those. And then, you know, one of the other big pieces is, you know, time zones and different work days and those pieces. So just really spending time um, getting to know working preferences, working styles and making sure being respectful of those. Yeah, I think asking questions is a great way to show that you're willing to learn. I have worked with um, a French company and similarly was like, am I doing things wrong? You know, dancing around it, but just really tried to be gracious and polite and giving it time. I think not rushing in in the first two weeks, um, but, it, you know, within like three months, I think we got into a rhythm. So I Perfect. think that is our time stop. So All thank right. you so much for the question. Thanks, everyone. Joining. Enjoy the rest of MopsCon. Bye. Yes, and we'll see you at the Mopsy Awards in a couple hours. Woo.